may as well change these backboards while we're at it, aren't we, as well? Is that not worth doing now? Anyway, welcome to the freaking vlog, everybody. Uh, so this morning we're meant to be casking um, the best bitter so we can make room for a brew day tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, but the uh, waste on the cask washer keeps getting blocked up, so unfortunately I'm going to be spending the next couple of hours down here sorting this lot out. Um, we've got random little drips coming off things as well, which uh, does worry me somewhat. shouldn't be leaking, that's caustic dripping out of there. There it is. That's dripping out of there, look Jim. So yeah, I suppose it's uh, about time we made a new cask washer. And it is on the itinerary, but we just don't have the time at the minute. So we've got to put this one together uh, so it lasts as long as possible, really. So I just need to change a couple of fittings. I've got a drainer tank down. I'll probably be in here for the next, I don't know, half an hour or more. And I've also got to install a pump to help the drain drain a little bit because obviously it's, uh, it's not. So the plan is washing machine pump in line with the drain valve. That's what used to be in there but it often clogged with, you know, the little plastic bits that come out of the casks from the shives. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. I'm waffling a little bit now, aren't I? So, uh, yeah, I'll just get stuck in with this job and then we'll pick up something else later on. Because it's gonna get that float switch. I thought I was smart enough to drop a little 12 volt transformer in here to operate a 12 volt relay. That would be the ideal way of doing it. So the emergency stop should isolate every single piece of electric equipment on this system. Uh, this little control unit here houses the on and off switch of course for the heater and then sends live out to all the required uh, pumps. So, yeah, it looks like I am. So we've got a 16 amp breaker in there. This definitely needs rejigging. I've got something I can sit on without getting my back wet. How's this? Yeah, so what I'd like to do in the future, so the 16 amp breaker is running to uh, the emergency stop. So everything, all the live runs through the breaker. And then we've got the float switch indicator operates this relay here. So if the float switch is down, the relay is not charged. That means that no power can go to the element, thus preventing the element from burning out. We've got a huge shared um, earth bus bar here. That's going to the pump, that's pump live. Even though we've got the wrong colours on it. And then we've got going out to that pump. We have... Have I just cut it off? Yeah. So that would have been the supply. Yeah to the, uh, the drain pump, so that needs to be opened back up again. So we need to send this in through here. Do you think there's enough room for another cable in there? It's quite don't, tight. Don't look like it, does it? It is pretty tight. Mm, I don't think we'll get another cable through there which is a shame, but we can add another cable gland if need be. Pop a 3 8 hole in there.
There we go. We can bring this cable in and round. Anyone would think that were made for the job, wouldn't they? So, tighten that up because we want it watertight. There we are. And then what we have to do is pull this back off again. So this is for the pump. This is basically just switching the live for the pump. So we want live coming off this live bar going through this section here. Oh, you know what? Uh, I could have probably sent it straight into that box. Let me just double check what I'm actually doing here. Am I switching alive? Where's my multimeter? Am I switching alive or providing power? Well, considering it's not hooked up on the other end, doesn't matter, does it? So that to that. So I'm switching alive. That's easily done then. So that doesn't need anything else doing to it. We can close that cover back up. That's ready to go. I could have put a live and neutral into here and fed the pump directly from that switch. But we'll do that on the next one. On this one, it's not rigged up that way. So Cell V, that's the way it goes, big nose. So what we're gonna do, because we are gonna rebuild this cask washer, we just need it to work for the next couple of months as it is. So this is a little bit of a bodge. It's a safe bodge, but a bodge is a bodge, nonetheless. So uh, to any professional sparks out there, it might not look, might not look very attractive. It doesn't really matter which way around we do this. That's a nice flexible rubber cable. Better than the PVC stuff, these rubber ones. But they are pig to cut. There we go. So, we don't need an earth. We do need, however, a neutral. Oh, that's not gonna be neutral though, is it? Sunshine. That's gonna be a switch live. Concentrate. I'm rushing a little bit, you see. Probably not always the best move in something like this. So I know to the untrained eye this looks like I'm lining up the wrong cable, but in fact, this is actually carrying live up to the switch here. And then it's gonna bring that live back down again. And it's going to go to the pump after that. So let's get that. Bad boy in that. Make sure he's anchored down. So I think I built this box initially, probably three, four years ago. And you learn a lot in three or four years. Right, and then that, we need a little bit of a chocolate block. So I'm just gonna nip down the bottom of the unit and pick one up. Hello, mate. So we've got a little terminal block here. Again, just a temporary fix. And you know what? I've seen far worse electrics than this in my time taking things apart. Remember when I had that uh, autoclave that we bought off an auction? Yeah. Jesus, you should have seen the wiring in that. And that came out of a professional, um, you know, big, 
egg processing factory that made stuff for supermarkets. And I was even surprised at the quality of the sparks in there. So there we go, so that's the live coming out. Off it goes to, uh, comes out of there, off it goes to the switch and then back again, then through this orange cable which runs off to the pump and then this comes back as a neutral now. So we can pop this neutral cable into any of these neutral ports here because this is essentially uh, a neutral buzz bar. This little fella here, that's what you can think of it as. Yeah, look. So what we'll do is we'll clean up this cable here that comes from the heater and uh, we'll run it alongside that. I'll shove that back in oil. There we go. We'll nip it up. I can feel it nipping. There we go. So that now, even though it's a little bit Eve Robinson and bodged, it's going to work. I'm confident of that, young lady, young man. Screw that other back together. There you go. didn't trip off. Did you hear the relay click? And then, come and listen. Come and listen in there. In there. In there. In there. That's the drain plug. Drain plug? Drain pump. <laughs> right, so that works. All we need to do now is cut that bit of pipe to size, connect the drain back up, and we're done. Thanks for that. Oh folks, so I've got that much to do today. I keep stalling from one job to the next. Um, Gemma's just about to do this casking of the bitter. Uh, I don't think we're gonna get all this stuff out of the tanks in time to brew tomorrow. So instead of stressing myself and what have you, we're just gonna knock back the brew day a couple of days and maybe uh, maybe not start until Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that means I'll be brewing on Friday. It's not something I want to do, but I also don't want to stress myself out with these brews. I want to make sure that I get them right because we're going to do a couple of experimental beers. So, uh, a chap came over to see me a while back called Mark from uh, Northern Ireland. He brought some, fa well he sent me some fantastic beers and uh, if you read the YouTube comments back about two weeks, three weeks ago, he shared his recipe on there, which was for a pale ale clone, uh, a neck oil clone. So I'm gonna have a play with that. I'm gonna see if we can emulate that. It was a really good beer. And there's a few other things that I want to do as well. So I wanna make sure that I'm not gonna trip up on myself. And also, seeing as we've been uh, getting all of the brewery up to spec, if you like, one thing that I don't have at the moment is uh, batch codes, batch codes from the hops and that kind of stuff. So what I'm hoping to do is go through all the hop stock that I've got in here and uh, we'll take batch codes off, we'll put them on the system and the same for the malts, we'll go through all of the malts and uh, all this stuff down here. So we'll take the batch codes, which are these numbers here. We'll take the batch codes off the malts, we'll log them onto the system, and then when we use the malts, uh, it will flag up instantly whether we've got either that ingredient in stock, what batch it's from, 
and uh, all that kind of jazz. So previously I was manually adding the batch codes to uh, the brew sheet, which works, but uh, if I do it electronically like this and I put them in as they come into stock, I have to keep up with it. If I, f if I miss a day or two, it won't work. But if we do it this way, then if we do get any product recall on any ingredients that we buy, I can search electronically to find the batch number and what guile that batch would have gone into. So chances are, if we do have a product recall, things wouldn't make it that far down the product line anyway, the chain anyway. But if we've got it all uh, electronically on the system, then it's another box ticked for, um, you know, the health and safety executive and all that kind of jazz. So I'm gonna quickly do a stock take so we know what we've got in the building and then spend an hour or two putting those batch codes onto the computer. And then once that's done, we can start printing recipes off as we move forwards, knowing full well that everything we've got is recorded and documented. Whew. That was a gobful, right. I'm gonna get on with it. That's gonna take me some time. So I'll probably look a little worse for wear when I pick the camera up again. Cause I do actually hate the paperwork. Necessary evil though. It's funny how one job tends to lead you straight onto another. So what I've done with this shelving section is I've doubled its depth. So previously it could only hold one bucket of grain, but what I wanted to do was make it deep enough to hold a bag of grain, as you can see. <coughs> as you can see, it holds a bag of grain perfectly there. So what we're gonna do is get those buckets off the floor, uh, double them up on the shelves where we've got the space and then on the base here I've taken a pallet and I've cut it in half so what we're looking to do is have a pallet that fits perfectly underneath the sh underneath the racking so that any grain that we carry in stock like a stuff that we use a fair bit of like the car malts some of the crystals particularly wheat malt and black malt so they can live down on the bottom on a couple of pallets which fit perfectly under there. The stuff that's already open can live on the second and top shelf in buckets. When we have a full pallet of crushed pale malt, that can live out here just on the pallet. So normally I just buy all of my malts in crushed because I'm not sitting on the stock. I don't want to hold it in stock. Uh, and we generally get through a ton of malt. At the moment we're using around uh, four to five bags per batch of beer. So uh, 10 brews and that's a ton of malt gone. So uh, yeah, if we're doing three brews a fortnight, do not take long to get through that malt. So I'm just gonna nail the base pieces on these, this, uh, this half pallet here. That should tidy that section up for me and then when I put all the stock back on I can do a stock take and put that back into the computer. I'll tell you what though, it's quarter past four. This kind of stuff really gobbles into your day. We have finished the rack. I'm quite pleased with it. Look how tidy it all looks down there with the sacks of grain. And we've got plenty of room at the back of the buckets for half open bags. So these buckets don't hold a full bag. So there's all the storage space there, look as you can see. Jem's just helped me finish casking up today, thank you Jem. Because uh, we've had that much to do, we wouldn't have got it all done. So 
we've got another 12 casks of bitter out of this tank here, FV1. That's turned off. I'm not going to get to brew tomorrow because we've run out, run out of packaging. I need to get some of those bog hole casks down from up there and clean them on the cask washer. But having to play around with a cask washer this morning means that we've not really had time to uh, get everything out. What are these for then, Jen? This looks like there's quite a few casks here. I think there's enough to do another tank, isn't there? Probably, but some of them I've put my hands on the inside and they're just taking forever to clean up. Yeah, well they are old, aren't they? There's like a lot of residue like around the shop. See, this one looks bloody spotless. They're fine. Do you know when they're dry, you can't feel anything. But when it's wet, like you feel on the side of that one, it feels grubby. Yeah, you've got to be careful with them because obviously it's containing our precious amber nectar. But yeah, we'll just put them back on. Uh, keep giving them a blast with the old caustic and hopefully they'll come up. Is this the one that I put the stuff on then? The Fos gel? I think it is, isn't it? The one that's got no bog at all on the top. Have you scrubbed the stamp off? No. Did you wash it? Yeah. Well, where's that gone then? That's the one I put the Fos gel on. I thought it still had some bogger left on it. It did. That's why I'm... Is it this one? Oh, was it that was one? It that one? I was going to say, if it was that one, it's worked a bloody treat, is not it? Yeah, Could have been that, that one, one then. Yeah, so you see what I mean? It's very difficult to get enough packaging for the beer. So we've just done a quick stock take as well. Uh, we've got 60 casks in stock. 60 in there. Uh, we've got about three grams worth of uh, ingredients ready to brew up into beer. Um, so, yeah, there's no real desperate rush to brew another batch of beer, quite frankly. But I just want to get some stuff on the go, you know. Maybe I should uh, have a bit of downtime this week. Let's get some of this stock out of the cold room, actually, and then uh, get the cold room up and running. So I think I've pretty much got everything I need now, apart from a few push fit fittings, and then pick it up next week, eh? I think that's a sensible idea. So that's what we'll try and focus on doing tomorrow. Uh, we've got the fittings anyway, so these are the silicon fittings that I got to take, take us from a 38 mil OD to uh, a 22 mil and then I'm using a 22 mil to 15 mil push fit converter in there to take us down to 15 mil push fit. So four Jubilee clips on here and two push fit adapters and then that's it we're ready to go onto uh, you know onto the 15 mil pipe and start cooling. Right, well I think I'm going to wrap it up folks, it's getting on, uh, we've had to bring the kids down to finish off today's work in the brewery and were it not for having Gemma with me today I wouldn't have got any vlogging done whatsoever so uh, it's been one of them days. Hopefully it won't be as stressful tomorrow if we're going to leave some of this beer in the tanks, focus on the cold room, I know a lot of people are keen to see how that's going to work, work out. Uh, so let's make some progress on it tomorrow. So if you want to join me, you know where to find us. Hit that sub button and uh, I'll be back in the morning. Cheers.